it, let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Micah. We're continuing to study through some of these, what they call minor prophets. They really are major in that they were the Lord's servants back in the day, but they're classified as minor simply because their books are not as long as some of the others like Daniel and Isaiah and Jeremiah. And what we're doing is a survey of each of these prophets that prayerfully as we study, we can see pictures of Christ in each of these because as Peter said, they had the spirit of Christ in them and testified of his sufferings and the glory that should follow. There's no prophet ever that God raised up but what their message was Christ all the way back to Adam and all the way through till the time of Christ. They were announcing that he would come and the New Testament announces that he has come. And so we want to consider this in the book of Micah where we are now, the best place is start in Matthew and go back a few books. It's easier to find perhaps and I'm just giving you some time to to find this prophet. First of all, when we're looking at Christ in the book of Micah, I want us to consider some comparisons between Micah and the Lord Jesus. And it begins with Micah's name. A lot of times we see these names and never really take the time to look them up. But with the availability now of being able to look up things online just with a click of the button with a concordance, you'll find that the name Micah means who is like Jehovah. And Jehovah is the name that was given to Moses when Moses asked the Lord, well, if I go speak to the children of Israel, who shall I say has sent me? And he told Moses, tell them, I am has sent you. And that's what the word Jehovah is. It's a name for God. It's actually a verb, which means I am. And so a study of this prophecy makes it all the more clear when the question is asked by his name. Who is like Jehovah? Well, the answer is no one. So over the course here of this book of Micah, there are actually three messages in this book. And it begins, each one begins with a call to hear. When we say the Lord has spoken or the word of the Lord is read, that's the time to hear, to pay attention. You'll see that right here in Micah chapter 1 and verse 2. This is where the first message begins of, of three that are here in this book. Hear all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is, and let the Lord be witness against you, the Lord from his holy temple. Now that's not a good word when you see there, the Lord be witness against you, the Lord God. This is a term like you would find in a courtroom. And who is the witness against you? Well, it's none other than the Lord God himself. We, we say if God be for you, who can be against you? But the opposite is also true, that if God be against you, who can be for you? And so a very solemn message. The second message you find over in Micah chapter 3. In verse 1. So here again is the word here. And this is so vital. I know that I'm preaching, but the most important thing for any of us is to hear the word of the Lord. And so in Micah 3 and verse 1, this would be the beginning of the second message. And I said, Here I pray you, O heads of Jacob. And ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? So Micah clearly is being raised up to 
speak a word against these that were leaders in the land and were placed there by God, and yet they were directing the people in another way, not to the Lord. Sadly, that's the case with most preaching today, where a preacher will stand and he has an agenda, a program, and people follow, but he's not pointing them to Christ. That's a pretty good indication that God hasn't sent them, because any that God raises up, they're going to point sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the third message we find in Micah is in chapter 5 and verse 1. This is the beginning of the third message. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. As go the leaders, so go the people. And so here in this message, the first people that are addressed or condemned are the leaders, the judges, because they don't judge according to the truth. So Micah here is demonstrating the coming triumph of God amidst the present failure of the southern kingdom of Judah. Micah would have prophesied, as you can see, Back here in the very first chapter, in uh, chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morsethite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. So Micah's primary ministry was against the kings of Judah, Remember, the kingdom had been divided when Solomon died, and Solomon's servant, Jeroboam, had gone up and set up a place of worship in Samaria. And during the day of Isaiah, which Micah was a contemporary with Isaiah, so he would have lived during a time when Assyria would have come down and taken those ten tribes captive. And yet it's a twofold message. His primary message then is for the tribes of Judah. That's why it says there, which he saw concerning Samaria. That would have been the Syrians taking the ten tribes in captivity. But then Jerusalem, that was to take place some 150 years later. 150 years seems like a long time. But when the word is pronounced... What God says certainly must come to pass. And so he was a contemporary with Isaiah, but his focus was more on the common people of the surrounding Judean cities rather than the royal court in Jerusalem. I know these kings are mentioned, but his ministry would have been more to the people who were suffering under the leadership of these false leaders. And so between the two ministries, that of Isaiah and of Micah, the entire nation would know that Assyria was coming to do to them exactly what it was going to do to the northern kingdom of Israel, devastate the land and exile the people. We, all, we know, however, that in the day of Hezekiah that's mentioned there in Micah 1 and verse 1, the Lord raised him out, and the king of Assyria did come right to the walls of Jerusalem and threatened to take Jerusalem, but it was not to be. That was to be 150 years later when Nebuchadnezzar would take it. And the Lord intervened mightily, killed 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian army in one night, and Sennacherib, the general, returned to his land and later was killed by his own sons. You can see how God is sovereign. Whatever man proposes, and I know a lot of people today talk about what's going on in the world, the politics and world powers and all this, and they ask me often, what do you think is going to happen? The answer is exactly what God has purposed. That we know. Because it's the Lord who raises up men and puts them down according to his purpose. So just like with Israel... 
In other words, the northern kingdoms, Judah, was going to suffer this as a judgment from God as well because of its high-handed transgression of God's word. The indictment here is in Micah chapter 1 and verse 5, the very first message when I mentioned that this is like a court case. Well, what's the first thing you do when you get in court? You hear the indictment being read. Well, that's what the Lord does in verse 5. For the transgression of Jacob is all this. And for the sins of the house of Israel, what is the transgression of Jacob? Is it not Samaria? Well, what happened in Samaria? That's where they went up and set, set up the worship of the golden calf. It was idolatry. And what are the high places of Judah? It's not as if those that split off and went and set up their seat there in Samaria to worship the golden calves as if Judah now was pure. No. Here it says, what are the high places of Judah? That word high places talks about those places where people went and would set up groves and their idols that they learned from other nations and they went there to worship. You say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's because God had established one place of worship, which was to be there in Jerusalem, in that temple. And everything about that temple, the reason God set it up, was because it was a type and picture of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether it had to do with the priests that intervened, interceded on behalf of the people, that's a picture of Christ, the mediator whether it had to do with the sacrifices themselves. God ordained those blood sacrifices all those years. They were to continue until Christ came and offered himself unto his Father as the Lamb of God. And then the altar and the furniture, all of these were pictures and types of Christ. But they left that, or even worse, as it says here in verse 5, what are the high places of Judah? Are they not Jerusalem? They turned the Jerusalem into a place of idolatry to the point where they even brought these idols in and set them up next to the places, the altar that, that God himself had ordained and thought nothing of it. Sadly, that's a description of contemporary worship today. Whenever I see that term on a sign in front of a, a worship center, contemporary worship, it just causes me to, to fear because what it is is people trying to contemporize worship, make it more popular, and yet it's not according to the word. So let's take a look here in the time we have at Micah's threefold message. As I said in the first message where it begins here in Micah chapter 1, this is where Micah begins by indicting Judah for its idolatry. This is one recurring theme that we've seen all the way through Scripture as to why God brings judgment against a people or a nation. You can talk about all the sins going on, social sins and murders and adulteries and things that people tend to emphasize as sinful, but the number one thing which is compared to an infectious disease is idolatry. And the reason is it's because it's in our heart. We are all idolaters by nature. And unless God by his grace draws us to the Lord Jesus Christ to see him as the only one worthy of worship, we'll worship ourselves. That's what so-called free will is. It, it's I will. And I determine, but it's a, an offense to a holy God and for which God brings judgment. Here we see in this first message, the Lord using Micah to indict the people of the land. And they had gold statues, they had graven images found in Israel all over the land and particularly even in the temple itself they brought in. If you look in Micah chapter 1 and verse 9, you see how this is described 
as a disease. Verse 9, for her wound is incurable. For it is come unto Judah, he is come unto the gate of my people, even to Jerusalem. And then over in Micah 6, chapter 6, the third message, the same thing is repeated, verse 16. It says here, for the statutes of Omri are kept, and all the works of the house of Ahab, and ye walk in their counsels. These were kings of Judah before Hezekiah, that I should make thee a desolation, and the inhabitants thereof in hissing, therefore ye shall bear the reproach of my people. So the threatenings of God here to judge this people, you say, well, how could he judge a people that he raised up and put in that land? It's because of their idolatry. And so, as a masterful wordsmith, no, these prophets, they were not educated in the higher institutes of learning like you have preachers today go up and I need to get my doctorate doctor so and so no these were common everyday men and yet when you read these scriptures to me it's all the more evidence that they were not writing these of themselves this was the spirit of God I think about Peter's writing there in the New Testament who was he but a fisherman and yet when the Lord gave him a word to speak or to write, it was clear and plain as if he had been educated in some of the schools of higher learning, articulate, and yet he wasn't. He was a fisherman. Same here with Micah. In fact, he uses puns. That's what I love about reading some of these. In a long play on words to warn various cities that judgment was coming their way. Here's an example. To Beth Lehafra, that means the house of dust. If you look over in Micah chapter 1 and verse 10, this is an example of just how profound the word of God is. We read over it real quickly and we have tr trouble pronouncing these names and probably don't pronounce them right anyway. But nonetheless, you can see that every word is inspired and uh, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness. So here he, he says, declare ye not, verse 10, this is the first message. Declare ye it not, at Gath, weep ye not at all, in the house of Aphra, roll thyself in the dust. So if you didn't know that Aphra meant house of dust, then you might wonder, well, what all is that about? Well, Micah was telling the citizens to roll in the dust as a sign of mourning, that in light of the impending judgment that God was to bring upon them, it would be a time of very solemn mourning, rolling in the dust. There's another example there in verse 11, when it says, Pass ye away, thou inhabitant of Saphir, having thy shame naked. The inhabitant of Zanon came not forth in the morning of Bethazel. He shall receive of you his standing. So here... That word Zanon, it in the Hebrew means to come out. So Micah is warning the people that were going to be sieged and unable to come out of their city. So every word was significant. And again, to the city of Morsheth Gath, with Morsheth meaning possession, Micah explained that it would soon be giving away its possessions to others. So every one of these words had to do with that coming judgment. City after city was denounced in this fashion, ranging from the coastal plains of Philistia to the Judean hills near Jerusalem. The extent of the judgment would mirror the extent of the infection. It's like a doctor going in and doing exploratory surgery and finding cancer in a certain part of the body. Well, what does he do? Well, he continues to look 
just to see how far that cancer has spread. That's what the Lord is describing here. Every place where he has pronounced his judgment, it's because that's just as far as the idolatry had spread. In the end, no city was safe in Judah. And that's a reminder, too, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And if any had any hope in themselves of ever finding acceptance before God, it's not going to be in ourselves because we're all idolaters. And so Micah, throughout this first message, continues by addressing the wealthy. I'd mentioned earlier that he was a prophet to the common man. In other words, that's where he mingled. But he did have a message to the wealthy who thought that they could scheme and plot to take the land from the poor. That's what they were all about. They weren't thinking about the fact that their wealth that they had, it was God that had given it to them. And having what they had, rather than be content, again in their depravity, they sought ways in order to take even more from the poor. And this was reminiscent when you remember up there in uh, the story of Ahab, the king. Jezebel was his wife. And Ahab had that despicable plot to steal Naboth's vineyard. That's back in 1 Kings 21, if you want to note that. But that's an example of what was going on during this time. These upper-class land grabbers. They would seize the very possessions that those in the agricultural communities needed the most. But they didn't care. And for that reason, Micah pronounces a woe upon them, promising that God would bring calamity upon them that they could not escape. Here's a reminder again that it's not by silver and gold that anybody's going to be redeemed or escape God's justice. Now, only the work of Christ for the sinner is the sinner's escape. But any outside of Christ will certainly know God's condemnation. And that's what we see here in Micah chapter 2 and verses 1 through 3. These woes, this is all still part of this first message. Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. There's a description of what it is to be depraved and blind and left to yourself that all you can devise is evil. Jeremiah wrote about it in Jeremiah 17, 7. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, if we know it, it's because the Spirit has taught us. But there are so many that continue to try to figure out ways to make more money, make a living on the backs of others. And so when the morning is light, it says in verse 1, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and they take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man and his house, even a man and his heritage. You wonder why even in our society today, there's so many litigations. It's amazing, even in a town the size of Shreveport, when you drive down the road, you see so many signs for attorneys and lawyers. It's everybody suing everybody, trying to make a, a, a buck or even more. And the attorneys, the same way. They're not judging according to the law. They're simply trying to make a living off of suing others. And that's nothing new. That's what we see here. Verse 3, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, against this family do I devise an evil. It's interesting how that's put. Here they are laying in bed, devising evil against others. And the Lord said, against them I devise an evil. Now, this is a reminder that God is sovereign and just in all his ways. Whatever he does is right, and it's right because he does it. And when he says in Isaiah 45, he creates light and he creates evil. It's in this sense. He will bring evil against those that devise evil from which ye shall not remove your necks. 
often people think if they just had enough money, they could get, a, get away with anything. Nope. It says, for this time is evil. And so God is sovereign. The fields that they took from others would one day be taken from them. That's the message that Micah gives here in verse 4. You see, in that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. They just thought that those fields and those lands and those houses belonged to them, but no, they're the Lord's. And he gives and he takes away. And certainly that's what happened when God would use Assyria for the ten tribes of the north, but also Babylon later to settle the score. And so, of course, this kind of preaching, <laughs> you can imagine, was not taken kindly. People are offended rather than bow and hear, and there again it shows the hardness of the heart. A man will not repent unless God grants repentance. That's the only way that one will bow. And how did these show that they were not repentant? Well, they denied the coming judgment. They denied that what Micah was telling them was the truth. And they relied on several tactics that are still very common today in our religious circles, even in so-called Christendom. The first thing is to force the silence of the preacher. If you don't like the preacher, what he's saying, even though it might be according to the word, then chase him away, silence him. That's what we see in Micah 2 and verse 6. When they said, prophesy ye not, say they to them that prophesy, they shall not prophesy to them that they shall not take shame. I know over the years that I've preached the gospel, you know, the, the gospel is a double-edged sword. It declares the good news of Christ and what he's accomplished for his people, but it's full of bad news in the sense that it condemns anything that has to do with man. Do you realize that the Bible has nothing at all good to say about man and his works? It's all summed up by declaring there's none righteous, no, not one. And if we had the time, we could go over there to Romans chapter 3 and just see how God describes man in his sin and depravity. Nothing more than a serpent that every time it lays eggs, it's producing more baby serpents. There's none righteous, no, not one. So that's one way that they sought to dissuade the people was to silence the preacher. The second way, again in verses 7 through 10, was having a false security in God's patience. In other words, God was prophesying what he would do, and yet it wasn't to come to pass immediately. And so you see, that's how people get hard. Well, they get up in the morning, they look around, they think, no judgment. All right, press on. You can see that there in verse 7. O thou that art named the house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord straightened? Straightened in the sense of constrained? Are these his do doings? Do not my words do good to him that walketh uprightly? Even of late my people is risen up as an enemy. Ye pull off the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. The women of my people have ye cast out from their pleasant houses, from their children have ye taken away my glory forever? Arise ye and depart, for this is not your rest, because it is polluted. It shall destroy you, even with a sore destruction. So because God did not exercise his judgment immediately, they continued to pillage and to rob and feel secure by it. It says there, the robe with the garment from them that pass by securely as men averse from war. But thirdly, the way that they used tactics here against the message of Micah was that they favored 
preachers. They favored, there were other prophets in the land that would tell them pleasant lies instead of unpleasant truth. Well, that sounds familiar. People have itching ears, and so they're looking for preachers that are going to make them feel better, make them feel comfortable. And that's what was going on here with Micah. When you look at verse 11, if a man walking in the Spirit, notice Spirit there is not capital S. A man can't walk in the Spirit of Christ and speak falsehood. But if a man walking in the Spirit, their own Spirit, and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink. He shall even be the prophet of this people. That's the one they want. Ah, bring the wine, bring the strong drink, bring the pleasantry. Eat, drink, and be merry. And don't worry about what's to come. So, at the same time, there were those that the Lord had made receptive. That's what I love about reading these scriptures where there's judgment there's always mercy and there is a remnant that we find here that was even in the day of Micah though it was not everybody and though the majority were against the truth yet when you read there in verse 12 through 14 I will surely assemble O Jacob all of thee who's speaking here that's God himself I will surely gather what? The remnant of Israel. Paul said they're not all Israel that were of Israel. There were those that he would judge and condemn for their falsehood and their idolatry, but there were others that he would gather. I will put them together as the sheep of Bozrah. <laughs> I love that. The sheep of Bozrah. Who are the Lord's people but his sheep? Those that he gave to his son the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come and pay their sin debt. Christ said he was the good shepherd. He'd lay down his life for the sheep. As the flock in the midst of their fold, they shall make great noise by reason of the multitude of men. And the breaker is come up before them. They have broken up and have passed through the gate and are gone out by it. And their king shall pass before them and the Lord on the head of them. When it says the king shall pass before them, what's that a picture of but Christ leading out his sheep? That while destruction was upon the land, yet it was the Lord himself who was to be that gracious king. The second message we find then is where Micah describes the nature of this gracious king. So while he's been in the first message, bringing indictments. In the second message, he is describing this gracious king and the righteous kingdom that belong to the king. You see, they're the kingdoms of this earth, but whose kingdoms are they? They're the Lord's. He's the one that has established them and set them up. And so he began by contrasting this with the unrighteous southern kingdom of Judah. And the nation at that time was filled with corrupt judges, as we said, who disregarded the pleas of the oppressed. All of that we see over here in Micah 3, verses 1 through 4. And I said, hear ye. See, this is where the second message begins now. Heads of Jacob and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment who hate the the good and love the evil who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones. Who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them. This is uh, picturesque but grotesque when you think about how these to flay the skin, skin somebody alive. That's how these are described. It's not that they were necessarily physically doing this. But rather than feeding the sheep, they were filleting the sheep. And they break their bones and chop them in pieces as for the pot and as flesh within the cauldron. They abuse and misuse the people. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time 
as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. That's talking about when he brings judgment. All of a sudden, these chieftains and princes and religious leaders, they get religious. We've seen it in our day. Bring a calamity, and boy, does everybody start talking about the Lord, seeking the Lord. Now's the time to seek him. All these things, but the Lord says that they would cry, and yet he would not hear them. You see, God's not at the beck and call of sinners to do their bidding as they will. No, he's sovereign and just in what he does. And so his justice and his judgments are, are true and right. He'll disregard the pleas of these judges when they cry unto him. And uh, leave these so-called prophets in darkness. Why? Because they're already in darkness. When they would seek answers from him. You see that in verse 6. Therefore night shall be unto you. They're children of darkness already. But oh when the Lord removes whatever light he has given. How great is that darkness. That ye shall not have a vision. And it shall be dark unto you that ye shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. But just like in the first message, this second message, Micah ends this prophetic warning with a promise. So you have the prophecy, and then you have the promise. And the same promise that Isaiah was giving his hearers in the capital city in the last days. In other words, referring to the time of the promised Messiah. That God would, after the destruction of Jerusalem, rebuild the city and once again make it a beacon for the world during that time. That we see in Micah chapter 4 and verses 1 to 3. But in the last days it shall come to pass. It's talking about the last days referring to the time when Christ would come. That the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills. And people shall flow unto it. He's not talking about physical natural Jerusalem there. He's talking about when Christ would come and lay the foundation of the new Jerusalem. In that place where the old Jerusalem had stood. And many nations shall come and say come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord. To the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths for the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem and he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks nation shall not lift up a sword against nation neither shall they learn war anymore that's a verse we've heard before and there's even a popular song with those lyrics well, what's it talking about? It's talking about when Christ would come and establish his kingdom, which he did. And that those from the nations would be drawn unto him. Christ was given of his father a people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. That he's redeemed unto God. And they are the ones that come to him. And the battle's over. That's really what verse 3 is describing. Whenever a sinner is drawn to Christ... They're brought to see that he is the one that settled the matter. And uh, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in him. This is describing the, the fruit of Christ's work when he would come. And this is given against the backdrop of the pending judgment that God would bring upon Jerusalem. There would be a judgment. To come that the Lord Jesus Christ himself would bear. As the sin bearer of that remnant of his people. And he did. When he came and laid down his life. It was that God might be just to justify. Each one of those that the father had given him. And that's how Micah is describing that coming kingdom. It's, it's, it's come. It's on earth right now. Christ came and established it. And uh, it's a kingdom of peace. It's a peaceful kingdom. That's what's described there in, in verse 3. And uh, it would be preeminent. That's what was described there in verses 1 to 2. 
there's no other kingdom that we're to look for than that which has already come in the person of Christ. And uh, it would be prosperous. That's how he describes it in verse 4. They shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken it. Well, that's the case of those that Christ has come and paid their sin debt, and they prosper in him. As Paul wrote to the Ephesians, that we're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Oh, what a blessed hope, then, is given through Micah's message here. It would be a powerful kingdom. You see that in verses 6 through 8. It, in that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. What did Christ say? Come unto me, all ye that labor. And are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And I will make her that halted, what? A remnant, and her that was cast off, a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them. This is not talking about some future reign. That's talking about now that Christ has come. In Mount Zion, from henceforth, even forevermore. Well, I'm going to pause there because there's a lot more to see, particularly with regard to the third message that... Micah had, and there we see specific reference to the birthplace of Christ and to what God had promised by bringing his son into this world, the salvation that would be accomplished in him. So we'll look at that, Lord willing, the next time. And I pray what we've seen, the Lord will bless. Amen. Amen.